Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, we're we're um, going to be waiting for a bit uh, because Akhil Bhai, who's in San Francisco, is um, unfortunately there's uh, a storm coming up and his internet is um, not very stable. So Shamantra and I decided that we would come in and say hello to all of you and um, maybe um, have a slow conversation so we can await his arrival. So, so Shimonto, uh, how, how does it feel? Well, before how it feels, you know, the winds of change have hit America, thank God. And yes. part of the result of winds is that Zakir has a wind factor that has hurt him <laughs> in a way that has uh, healed America, I hope. But while we wait for him, you know, I, I know that we shot a film in, in G5A with, with Zakir and Niladri. And it was the first time that actually a film like that was made. And actually that film is going to be shown, but we'll plug, I'll give you that plug a little later. Because right now I thought uh, we talk about how you think, or I'll tell you what I think, because I, I've watched Zakir now over many years. But I think that the intimacy that uh, the G5A space brings to the Hindustani classical concert is, I think, unique in our city because A, in small spaces, what happens is that the sound is not so professional, the setting is not so professional, the backstage is not so professional, and all of that impinges finally on how you produce the art. And I think because G5A is so well run and so well designed, you can take a bow now. Yes, that, yes. thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that it is so comfortable before the show that by the time you get onto the stage, you're in a comfort zone. You know that things are going to be run professionally. And I think that that makes a huge difference to the way, um, you know, uh, or musicians interact with each other. And also because of the proximity of the audience, yeah. it's like a baitak without being a baitak. It's a professional Absolutely. sound, professionally run, but a baitak quality to it. And I think that that adds hugely to uh, how that mu music is, our music is produced and how it's appreciated because um, the, the way the audience is situated is very critical to how intimate you can be with what you're saying. Uh, when you have to broadcast it to 2000 people, then obviously you play differently, even though there's a microphone, but where, where you know, you're um, in, a, in an intimate zone, the playing yeah. changes as well. How how do how do you find uh, musicians? Because you've dealt with many more than I have in that space. How do you feel them reacting to the G five A space? You know, uh, first of all, thanks so much. I I couldn't uh, have hoped for a better uh, well plug <laughs> but it's true. for G five A. No, it's not a plug. Uh, I mean, I know that I'll but, get free tickets for the rest of my life, but it's not a plug. Yes, it's the truth. <laughs> But yes, uh, no, you know, it reminds me of a very, very uh, special time. We had um, a concert um, uh, that the Hindu, in fact, had, had um, uh, I think, sponsored. And uh, they were doing it to raise funds for the Chennai uh, floods, um, if I recall correctly. And we had um, uh, three musicians and Anita Sairam, uh, we had a flautist and I'm just Rono Mazumdar mm -hmm. and uh, there was um, one other artist and I shouldn't be forgetting his name but anyway but the, the interesting thing was we uh, and you know Benny and Mujib are, are, are sound um, yeah. and tech wonderful. guys yeah, yeah. So, yeah they, they really helped create uh, the, the, the sound that we uh, hear at G5A um, and what, what happened was that they said, let's, why don't we try uh, to um, have it as acoustic as possible? And so what they did was they decided not to mic uh, the performance. And they, um, in fact, just, just, I think, gave it a little reinforcement uh, mm. sound. So they had these uh, very, very uh, <laughs> elegant and small mics. Um, uh, but other than that, there was no miking. So the musicians actually uh, were a little afraid uh, or rather, uh, I guess they were concerned that because they have gotten now so used to having amplification that uh, they were 
you know, really concerned and worried as to whether their voice would uh, carry it and all of those things. And mm. uh, fortunately, the both of them, uh, Mujib and Benny, were able to convince them that let's give it a shot. And we're here. So if you need that reinforcement, we can always give it. Um, but uh, I cannot tell you how magical that performance was because, yeah. and, and the musicians, so, so Ranu Mazumdar actually um, said afterwards, he said, my flute was breathing differently. And yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought that was just, um, for me, just such a magical moment that, uh, that I, I, you know, I almost burst into tears, but, but it was no, so that's so not, it's really that's not about, unusual. So it's all right. <laughs> yes. But uh, so, so it's been things like that. A lot of musicians have, have, um, uh, should I say, reconnected with that kind of relationship with the audience. Um, mm. and, and in fact, uh, the other musician uh, there also said that the audience behaved differently, which yeah. was interesting because, because you know, then you, you have to also be in the present. You're not sort of busy looking at your phones. Mm. Uh, you have to also, as an artist, um, engage a little more um, and make that effort. So I think uh, that's really quite special. And I think because I had the privilege of, of growing up with listening in on Bertuts like this, um, you yeah. know, watching plays at, at um, Chabil Das and all of that, uh, that, that it actually uh, made sense to recreate a space like this because we've, we're fast losing that. And um, as someone who's also worked in films um, and made films, I realized that, you know, uh, when, when you go and you know that uh, better than me, that if you take after all that blood, sweat and tears that you put into making your film and then you take it to a space which doesn't have the tech support that is, is, that is required, it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we really worked with our sound team to, to really ensure that both live sound as well as um, uh, uh, sound from Cent for Cinema, et cetera, would uh, work and and they of course wrote me off as being completely crazy uh, and that it was wasn't possible but in the end they they did it so that's oh, terrific uh, yeah great yeah yeah so I think uh, what I'll do Anuradha to save time yeah. uh, yes. I will introduce myself to everybody since okay. nobody no, nobody knows who I am and everybody everyone knows, who knows you, you. Are. everybody everyone knows who knows you are you. and Zakir of course nobody knows or recognizes but you'll have to, he'll have to manage. So basically, uh, that'll save us some time so that when Zakir. But I was supposed to do that, out, Shamal. Forget it. You can do it as well. But basically, okay. I'm <laughs> saying that it'll save us the time because when Zakir comes okay. on, we won't waste time yeah. on a useless introduction of me, which no one cares about. So we'll save that time now. Uh, basically, what happened is that because Anuradha did this entire huge show at the last minute, she had very little choice as to who she could get to run this particular conversation. And so she picked me out of a hat. And uh, there I was clutched in her fingers out of a hat and remained there. But basically why I think I was uh, acceptable um, is that I have actually worked with Zakir on about three films. And that has led me to at least some sort of understanding and appreciation of how his mind works um, and how, how he prepares, how he, um, what, you know, various sides to him. Because the first film I made with him was uh, 30 years ago, practically. And the most recent film I did with him, which was actually shot in G5A, was three years ago. So yeah. over 27 years, I've had enough truck with the maestro to be able to, I hope, um, not be utterly petrified at the end of this conversation as I am at the beginning of it. So let's hope that it all works out and I hope he can join us soon. I now see that many more people have entered the waiting room. So for all of you guys who've entered, we are waiting for Zakir Bhai's Wi-Fi to behave. Um, Wi-Fi's have wills of their own, as you know, and uh, even a genius can't control his Wi-Fi. So we are waiting for the master.
Over to you, Anuradha. Do you have something to add to uh, why you decided on this conversation in the first place? As, as also the end of a very, very vibrant and vital uh, exercise that you did over the last five, six days. Why, why end with, with this particular conversation? So, um, I think what, what we were seeking to do with this festival, apart of course from uh, celebrating our, our fifth anniversary, was that you know, we really wanted to, uh, Budu, for the, uh, for the um, next phase, as it were, for, for ourselves, we wanted to begin um, uh, conversations which were, um, which were uh, new and uh, sort of founded uh, on uh, sort of a, a range of things. So, which is why the, the, the festival has sort of been shaped the way it has. Um, and I was really lucky, we all were, that, that we got all of you uh, at, at this last minute. Um, and and it, I feel uh, if, if, if some of you haven't heard the, the, um, the, the other sessions, please do catch it on YouTube because it, it, all of it really sets a certain kind of context and uh, ecosystem for us all to, to sort of uh, work in and, and think about. So... Um, what I, I feel is that this session in particular for me uh, is, is um, extremely important because it, and as I've known Zakir Bhai for, for some time now, and of course been uh, a huge admirer of his, of his uh, work as, as you know, 10 million others or 100 million others. Um, I, I felt that a conversation with both of you uh, where you are able to really talk about the the uh, the form making, which is really about the art, the rigor, the 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 entire sort of dedication that that one um, has to have uh, to be in touch with that uh, special sort of zone. Um, I think is the note that I felt would be the best to to close. Because in a way, it's not the close; it's a sort of new beginning yeah, after of this. Course. Yes. So, uh, so, so for us, uh, having traversed, you know, from the beginning, we sort of started with can, uh, can art break the silence? To, uh, to this, I feel uh, in many ways is a wonderful journey, uh, a brief journey, but a wonderful one, which sort of opens yeah. up various threads. Um, so, so yeah, for me. Um, and, and, and I think Zakir Bhai exemplifies that really in terms of what I said earlier, which is the, the of course, the sort of pure talent. But a, apart from that, the, just the, the focus, the, uh, the, the dedication and um, uh, uh, the, the sort of commitment to that art form, which, which uh, is, I think uh, we have very few exemplars like that. And so it mm. felt like the ideal sort of bridge also, I think, the festival. I, I think it's wonderful that you started off with a conversation about God and atheism. And, also, exactly. And, and, and we are ending with a glimpse of Godhood in a way. Because well I feel that uh, art is, I'm a diehard atheist, but I have glimpsed something beyond through art. And that has been my one connection to something... <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Godhead? Godhead. <laughs> we were talking about God, and there you are. Come on, yeah. you atheist. What are you talking about God for? <laughs> I, I see, I see. There's one behind in, me. <laughs> I see both of them in front of me. Oh, shush. Yeah, yeah. I'm How sorry, It's it? it's been very windy and strong, and, and, and the connections have been... Ori and I had to come back. I, I had to get up at five in the morning today to, you know, get ready and then drive over to the studio and set up and all that stuff. So it took a while, can, but we got it done. We're here and and we have to tell the audience that's listening that we requested Zakir Bhai to be with his tablas today. 
uh, only yesterday. So, so I'm trying to keep them you. warm because it's uh, six degrees uh, centigrade here. Wow. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep we'll try it warm. And we'll bring you the warm. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, we're ready to go if you're ready to go. By the way, I'm being we controlled. Are. I'm being controlled by a man called Aditya Srinivasan, uh, who's handling all these microphones and the sound settings and everything going directly to you. And he actually is in Chennai. Wow. Oh, wow. Thank you, Aditya. <laughs> Thank you, Aditya. I don't think he can hear you. I mean, he can hear you, okay. but you can't hear him. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, gratitude so... Gratitude goes out... Gratitude goes out in waves to Chennai. Oh, my God. Yes. On the waves. Okay, guys. Okay. May I, may I do my formal welcome... Yeah, please. Even though we've had our own. <laughs> okay. You, you want us to become invisible? No, no, no. no, no. I'm no, not no, becoming no. invisible because I never come back. So. <laughs> okay. As All happened right. the last time, Zakir. Uh, okay. okay, here we go. So, good evening and welcome to the second part <laughs> of our closing session of Should Art 2020. As I said in part one of our closing session, what an incredible week it has been especially for all of us at G5A. First, the many inspiring and important sessions of Should Art 2020, a multidisciplinary virtual art and culture festival that began on November 3rd, celebrating our fifth anniversary, which I do hope many of you were able to join. Then out of nowhere, Maharashtra government permitted the opening of theaters at 50% capacity on November 5th, Coincidentally, we had planned to have a special open air early morning concert without audiences, of course, at the G5A Terrace on the 6th by two very talented young musicians, our very own team G5A Shalaka Redkar and Rutuja Lal. And last night, our planned table read unanimously became a stage reading in our black box of Disgraced, a Pulitzer award-winning play written by Ayad Akhtar, directed by Danish Hussain and performed by a wonderful cast, Ali Fazal, Sheena Khalid, Denzel Smith, Ritasha Rathor, and Zahan Kapoor. Every one of the cast and crew came on board immediately and spontaneously, and what a heartfelt performance it was. It was also memorable and moving for all of us, as it was the first time we were all back in the, at the theater after the pandemic struck some seven months ago. And to make it even more special, Port Kitchen and Bar, our restaurant, also opened fully with most of our staff back. Much food and wine was had. Yay! And it must be mentioned, the tension-filled race to the White House and the election of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States of America, and possibly even more exciting to see Kamala Harris be elected as the first woman, first African-American and first South Asian American to serve as the Vice President of the United States. Congratulations, America. And today for the final day and session of Should Art 2020, we couldn't have asked for a more fitting finale. Now beating time in conversation with Zakir Hussain and Shamantro Ghoshal. Welcome. Thank you. And Shamantro, here's the real introduction. So Shumantra Ghoshal gave up a successful career as an advertising filmmaker, and ever since he has pursued a range of artistic activity that excites him. His passion for the documentary form led to some acclaimed work, the speaking hand, the unseen sequence, the space between the notes, and Kefi Nama. He is also involved in an ongoing creative collaboration with Malvika Sarukai on her dance projects. Besides this, he continues to write and translate poetry. His translations of Jan Nisar Akhtar are scheduled for publication in 2021. He's currently partnering a museum, MAP, in making a series of short films and exploring individual works of art. Shamantro, you not only exemplify a special understanding of the art of filmmaking, but also allow us to experience a quiet and deep immersion in the work of your subjects and the brilliant nuances of their craft. Thank you for the work you do. And thank you for tonight enabling us 
a glimpse into the special rapport you share with Zakir Bhai. Zakir Bhai, of course, we all know and love. And so I will not take much time here to give his formal CV. We now have the internet, thankfully, for that. But cannot not mention that he is widely considered a chief architect of the contemporary world music movement. Zakir Bhai's contribution has been unique with many historic and groundbreaking collaborations. A Grammy Award winner, he is the recipient of countless awards and honors, including the Padma Bhushan, Sangeet Natak Academy Award, and Officier in France's Order of Arts and Letters. Zakir Bhai was resident artistic director at San Francisco Jazz from 2013 until 2016, and was honored with SF Jazz's Lifetime Achievement Award on January 18, 2017, in recognition of his unparalleled contribution to the world of music. Apart from being a universally recognized genius artist, Zakir Bhai is also a really special human being. His grace, warmth, his calm, his charm, his wicked wit and on-point sense of humor make him truly one of a kind a rare combination of unbridled talent, dedication, and compassion. It is said that Ustad Bilal Khan described him thus. He said, Allah ne use zakir ko bohot hi sukoon se banaya hai. Need I say more? I have had the privilege to have known him since my early teenage years, not to mention the predictable big crush and then later over, over the years got to know him a little better till finally I had the courage to talk to him about my dreams and ideas for G5A more than I think six years ago. He immediately made time to visit the under construction site and then chatted with me and my father who I have to say shares a unique relationship with uh, and gave ideas and suggestions and of course all of his support and also graciously accepted to be a part of our advisory council. That alone, I think, helped me to take the next steps towards building the G5A that I had dreamed of. For that, I will remain indebted forever. Sub subsequently, he has visited G5A several times to perform, to test equipment, for meetings, and more. For immediately agreeing to make time for this session tonight, even though it meant you had to get up at 5 a.m. and with temperatures around five degrees. For all of this, Zakir Bhai, thank you. So now it's my pleasure. over to you. Thank you, Anuradha, thank you. But that was not a CV. <laughs> <laughs> so Hi. when, when uh, Anuradha asked me to do this session, I decided. I just want to say I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I know you're fine, thank you, and I'm well too, <laughs> even without a drink. Oh. So when Anuradha asked me to do this session, and I decided to call it, I decided to call it beating time. That was for the obvious reason that beating time is just another way of saying or talking about keeping rhythm, and that's something that. Uh, Zakir, Ustad Zakir Hussain has done for all his life and probably does like his father in his sleep as well. But there's another aspect to beating time because time outdates us all. Time is fads, time is fashion. Um, the poet Auden said, time watches from the shadow and coughs when you would kiss. And that is true. You know, time uh, is something that we have to battle with in a way. And how do creative artists do that? They do it, I think, through uh, trying to remain fresh and green and relevant. And how do you remain fresh and green and relevant? You do it by reinventing yourself. You do it by reinventing repeatedly how you deal with your instrument, how you deal with people around you and all of that. And we are going to talk about that idea of beating time as well. But to kick it off, I'm going to start with a memory. Uh, I've known Zakir for 30 years, though, I mean, he may not admit to this in public, but um, I will not start with a memory of mine. I'll start with a far older memory from a far wiser man. And this is uh, the great guru, 
and sitar player Pandit Arvind Parik. And he talked about a concert that his guru played, Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib. And in the interval, Zakir was there, and in the interval, uh, Khan Sahib took Zakir in his arms and um, he said to him, Acha, jhaptal padke suno. So Zakir did that. And then he said, Rupak. And Zakir obliged. And there's nothing actually too amazing about that because this is what tabla players do. But what was extraordinary is that Zakir at that point was one and a half years old. Now, for somebody like me who treads firmly on the ground and only looks up at the stars, Zakir, how is this even humanly possible? I think, uh, first of all, it's great to be here at G5A's festival. Uh, and thanks for having a chat with me. Uh, you, are, you are a very special landmark in my life. And I thank you for that. Now, uh, I think, I mean, I have to say that with the risk of sounding very mythological, uh, there are instances and stories as far back as our Mahabharata, where Arjuna speaks to his wife about the art of Chakravyu battle, and Abhimanyu in her tummy listens to her. And that's how he, uh, that's how he remembers, listening through her, yeah. what has happened. Uh, for me, it was the other way around. Uh, my father, from day two, when I was born, a day two were brought home, which held me in, in his arms and sang rhythms in my ear. <coughs> so whether there was wakaidas or relas or takers of different rhythm cycles and so on. So I guess the idea was to get all that information inside of me as quickly as possible. And one of the reasons for that was that he was not well. He was uh, very ill at that time, and people felt that, uh, you know, he was on his way, you know, out to leave us and go to the heavens. And uh, so his need, his desperation to get that information out uh, made him t take me in his arm and sing rhythms in my ears. So um, without really trying hard to learn, the information was already injected into the mind. And uh, I guess I found myself, by the time I was five months old or six months old or seven months old, uh, in, in some way that kids do, yeah. actually mime the words of the rhythms. You know, or stuff like that. <laughs> and, and when that happened, uh, I guess... Uh, Sometimes people get a little carried away and, and a child does something and they uh, you know, connect, connect it to something very special and say, oh, look, the kid is doing that. Well, the kid is not necessarily doing that. It's just, you know, just mouthing off. Uh, but by the time I, I, was, I was a year old, I guess, uh, and I was saying some things, uh, it was much easier for me to speak the language of rhythm language of tabla than to be able to form words in Urdu uh, uh, or Hindi at, in my home. So a simple thing like da, din, tin, this was easier than yeah. trying to say ya mujhe paani chahiye, and stuff like that. That required a little bit more control of your uh, uh, ability to be able to mouth words. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I'm trying to rationally explain this. Yeah. And, 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 and I think this is exactly, I think, what happened. And uh, I would not just, uh, you know, solo it to just me being like that. I'm sure there were kids all around in every musician's home, sons and daughters, who probably had the similar... Uh, uh, upbringing and, and, and at the age of one, two, three were able to do that. Examples are there. Uh, Yusrini was performing incredibly like a great maestro at the age <coughs> seven or at the age of three sitting in the auditorium 
and, and, and a maestro performing and, 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 and saying, oh no, that is wrong. That's the wrong note. This is a three-year-old doing it. And so uh, I guess there are instances when this happens and, and I'm not a special uh, person in that situation. I just happen to be getting the same kind of transmission that my fellow uh, young ones at that time, my fellow wee bairns got. And, and by the time I was a year and a half or two, I was able to mouth those words because they were already in here, placed mm. uh, in, in some kind of confusing order. And, 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 and I guess my mind made some sense of it because I was seeing uh, students perform uh, practice in the house and just listening to them and trying to beat it out on any surface that I could find. Usually it was my mom's cooking pots. And, and, and so, yes, I would explain it that way. I would not say that it's okay. something unique or special. I think it's just one of those traits in, in, in a musician's family that happens. Oh. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that I no longer have to treat you as unique or special. That's it's a relief. Thank you very I've done, much. I've done that now for 30 years. But, Zaki, you know, when I think back to my own childhood, and when I was seven, mm -hmm. and, the, and the kind of bonding I had with my father, and I think this may be true of most seven-year-olds and their fathers, he was a very busy man at that point. He was working, mm -hmm. and he was running a company, and... I had my playmates and all of that. And I think most seven-year-olds and their fathers don't have a bond because they don't have common ground, except for parental love. And I think what was extraordinary about your growing up, and this is also perhaps true of other musicians, um, is that you had a bond. You had a bond and that bond was music. And so I want to take you back to when you were seven and when beating time became a formal idea, it was no longer the idea of beating on dishes. It was no longer the idea of babbling uh, tabla bowls rather than nursery rhymes or rather than prosaic sentences. It became something else. It became something which would determine, I think, where you were going to go. So what was it like when you were seven? Uh, first of all, I'd like to touch on what you said about the bond uh, a little bit. Uh, it was an advantageous situation for uh, kids in a music family. And, in the and, and that's because the musician was home all day. Yeah. There was time to make that connection. And, and, and that time was regularly available. Uh, as opposed to, uh, say, your father or, or fathers in similar situations who had to go to work, who had to go to the okay. offices yeah. and therefore disconnect from you. And, 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 and in retaliation to that disconnect, you connected with your pals, your mates, your friends and, and the nursery rhymes and whatever else that you had to. And so in doing so and breaking that connection rather than just uh, being connected to his memory, his thoughts, his ideas, and waiting for him to come and expand further on it. Uh, and, 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 and so you had to reboot every time. And, and because of that, uh, maybe it wasn't as solid, uh, and it took uh, rebuilding every time, every night, every evening. For us, and for me or whoever else, uh, it was a routine that went through the day. And therefore, the connection was uh, a, a more uh, 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 solid, more strength-oriented, more connected. And, and so that's what I want to say about the bond. And with my father, it was no different. And when my father was not there, his students were there. And so the information kept flowing, and the same uh, uh, chain of thoughts uh, were expanded upon by them. So it was all available in that manner. Mm. Now, when I was, when I reached the age of five, six, seven, uh, I was left to my own devices. <laughs> and the reason for that, I later analyzed uh, uh, after I had forgiven my dad 
for leaving me alone and 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 not caring for me, but for his students or whoever they were. Uh, in my early age, I thought that they were bringing him flowers and bringing him gifts and sweets and all that stuff. So that's why he was paying attention to them and not me. But that wasn't so. He was just allowing me, <coughs> as a kid, as a student, to, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, put to use the information that has already been put inside of my head, in, to, in, in my subconscious mind, and, and get that forward. And, and that kind of leaving me alone to sort things out uh, was a very important part of my training uh, because it was always in his head that he should not be the, like, I mean, my father would think that I should not be like him. I should not do him. Yeah. I should not be a Laraka, but I should be Zakir Hussein. I should be someone else. So therefore, the information that I had received had to be analyzed, sifted through, assimilated, whatever you want to call it, and then put to use as my portfolio, as my CV, as my information, the way I yeah. saw it, my interpretation. And, and to allow me to do that rather than be you know, how you say, uh, a student who recites 500 times what he or she is told or sings the sargams up and down for hours on paltas for hours, I was allowed to be able to do that same thing, but in my own way. And, 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 and I could, instead of dha tete, dha dha tete, go dha tete, dha tete, same number of beats, but find my own way around it. And so uh, when I arrived at the age of seven and I was all, my hands were long enough, big enough to be able to fit on the tabla to be in place for all activities on the instrument, uh, I was already playing. I was already starting to get that information out there mm. and, and in some ways have my own way of speaking tabla. And, 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 and but the, what was interesting about that is that with that came chutzpa. With that came, yeah, uh, with that came this realization that, hey, uh, I've, I've got this covered. I know what I'm doing. And, 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 and that awe-inspiring revelation that comes with being in front of your guru, just doing the mantra as prescribed uh, was not there. It was something very normal something just fun, something just to enjoy and do. It wasn't a 2000 year old tradition. It wasn't wash your hands and take a shower and wear f nice clothes and you know, to burn the agarbati, the incense and put it there and then start practicing none of that. Just, I would be playing cricket and on the beach in Mahim run back in and straight to the tabla, boom, 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 boom. My mother would call, have food, have food, go out, play with friends, come back and play tabla. So it was like part of a daily routine. So when I got to the point where I could do this, but I was constantly going to the concerts with my father, his take was, okay, he's got that information. Now let him see how I use the information on stage myself. So he can then, uh, take that information and try to put it to at the age of seven. I was already being put to that through that uh, exercise uh, without me knowing about it. So I but was I already. Think, I think, Zakir, you talk about uh, having a normal sort of childhood going out, running, and playing. But I think that what you had was abnormal because your daily life may have been normal but your nocturnal life was most abnormal for a seven-year-old. Yeah, I'm getting to that. So yeah. uh, uh, at the age of seven, I was already, you know, uh, uh, playing a little bit, uh, you know, and doing things. And I was at the concert with my dad. He was playing uh, and, and he was still recovering from his sickness. And, and so every now and then he had to get off a little bit, take a breather. And he usually had a student behind him who would, take over and play for a while along with the main artist while he uh, recuperated and came back. And at that moment though, I don't know what happened to him. Maybe he had noticed 
a spark there in me that I was ready for a test, maybe. And uh, so he asked the main artist whether if he, if the, when he was getting off that, if his son, seven year old sitting behind him should play. And the artist nodded like, uh, you know, that that was fine. And, and, and he looked at me and said, Bajayega, Bajaoge. And, and I said, yes, I mean, I wasn't, you know, in any way impressed with the moment. You know, I, I knew he was playing teen tal and, and I knew the taker and there's no reason for me to not uh, get excited about being able to do that. And, and I said, yes. So he said, do you know the tal? And I said, yes. And, and he said, take her, yes. Okay. I sat down and I picked up where the take up was and started playing. And the great maestro, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sahab, yeah, accepted me. <laughs> accepted me, a seven year old, and blessed me with that initiation, with that test. And, and it's that night when my father said to me, Will you, do you want to seriously do this? And uh, I had obviously made it through the test. And, uh, and I said, yes. And uh, so that uh, at three o'clock in the morning, he woke me up and we started connecting that bonding that needed to go to the next level, a level of, uh, I don't know, an unprecedented heights or whatever you want to call it, uh, and incredible revelations and so on. That began, and that was a very special time in my life because uh, what I had imagined in my head, all the information that was there, it suddenly started to make much more sense. It suddenly started to come in uh, into uh, 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 what what should I say uh, a proper arrangement, uh, mm. uh, you know, and uh, and suddenly I was hearing about Baba Malang. And, and the compositions of Baba Malang and Ustad Fakir Bakshkan Sahib and Mia Kadar Bakshkan Sahib, all these entities that I had no clue about, I had no knowledge about, and what they ate, how, what clothes, and they needed to wear two ghode ka boski, uh, silk uh, uh, kurtas, and, uh, and, and they had to put this much ghee in the, in their, in the, in the handi, to be able to make bhuna gosh or whatever they wanted to eat, all that information and, and where they were, what they did, and when a certain composition was being recited by him and he said to me one time that he was at Bhati Gate. Bhati Gate is an area in Lahore. Okay. And, and he said he was standing at a tea stall, which was of his uncle's. And, and, and uh, and Mia Kadar Baksh came by in Atanga and called him and, and, and said, uh, come here, Rakha. And he said, and, and, and Mia Kadar Baksh recited this composition and said, this came to me uh, this morning and I thought you should know this. And, and at that tea stall, uh, while he was handed, being handed a tea, Mia Kadar Baksh taught my father this particular composition. And then he recites the composition. And then I am like putting visual to the audio that's coming to me. And okay, just how is, how does this compute? How does this work? How does the composition uh, validate uh, the tanga, the bhati gate circle, the, the cup of tea, the, uh, and all that stuff. Uh, and, and, and it just was interesting and, and, and sort of a deep, uh, revelation that I did not grab on to fully at that time. Mm. But now, when I've had months of home time, uh, and I've been thinking back on these, uh, there, is a, there is much more of an understanding of layers of information and, and what it means. And, and so beating time brings, you know, it continues and, and, and I started to, uh, I've, it started at that time and I started to for next four or five years uh, just every night spend that three hour uh, gold time with him uh, I, when I felt I had him to myself and, and, and it was the best time it was uh, it was like flying in on the Udan Khatola uh, in, in the heavens with this incredible being and, and this great spirit and, and seeing 
the world of tabla through his eyes, through his ears, through his understanding. And it, and it was very special that those five yeah. years or so. And, and I have to tell you that that time spent with him was the most time that I had actually spent with him. Yeah. Because, yeah, what happened was uh, around the time I was 11 or 12 years old, he started traveling uh, a lot with Pandit Ravi Shankar. And then they started going away for six months, eight months, seven months, nine months away from India. And, and, and I had no connection except for postcards coming in from wherever, Manchester or London or Paris or whatever. And, and, and so that, I'm very thankful. I'm deeply grateful. And I feel blessed and, and like, wow, I was in the bus at the right time. I got those five, hour, five years and all that information. And, and it's it's held in good stead for me even now because there's information there that I'm still uh, unraveling in my head and, and, and putting, to, putting together and interpreting it onto my instrument. So the learning and, and understanding of time and how to express it uh, and uh, interpret it and, and speak it in my own way uh, uh, is, 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 is still 50 years down the road uh, still going on. Yeah, but. but you know, Zakir, one other <coughs> thing that I think began to happen because you keep talking about information that comes your way and how you use it. I, my uh, reading from what I've heard you speak is that there were two other areas which affects the playing of tabla and particularly your playing of tabla. I think one is the exposure to vocal music. Uh -huh. And um, your father was a Patiala Gharana singer. And of course, mm -hmm. you went to Bade Gulam Ali, and we'll come to that uh, because that's an interesting story. But I think there are two aspects that bring out the idea in Hindustani classical percussion of rust, which is mm -hmm. not necessarily true of rhythmic instruments per se, mm -hmm. which are more mathematical or more uh, marking of time. But this particular instrument, as the Pakhavaj, has, I think, the, the idea of modulation and of rust embedded in it. How do you think your exposure, and tell us about how you got that exposure to vocal music helped in the way you looked on the tabla. And again, I'd like to add another idea to it uh, after we talk about the, uh, the influence of vocal music, if any, on tabla, is the idea that tabla has a very expressive language and that is seen in Parhant. Hmm. And I think the idea of Parhant has embedded in it emotion, uh, because you cannot do parhant without modulation. You cannot just mark time. It has embedded in it the idea of storytelling, because, and it has embedded in it the idea of being able to use oral traditions expansively. Uh, because you, even without the tabla, you can be relaying the information that you have through parhant, through the bones. Hmm. So yes. I, I'd love you to talk about these two aspects early on in your life. Uh, I'd also like you to um, be able to tell our audience what Parhant is and how you modulate it and what you do with it. But first to come back to the idea of vocal music because you, you were going to Bade Gulam Ali, but that's a great story, tell us. Well, uh, I want to first say one thing about par Parhant or, or the language of Tabla. Yeah. Uh, it is a language. It is like Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu, English. Okay. It is it is that. So when and when you look at it that way, then you find embedded in it moods, mm. expression, feelings, emotions. They are already embedded in it. So when you're thinking about the phrases or compositions, you there is a visual to it. There is a thought that when you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, you, you're looking at a countertop, and that's the first, if you say so. Uh, and when, when there's a first is there, you lay that down first in your thought. And then on that first, you build whatever it is that you have to build. And that's 
the ability to be able to improvise, be spontaneous, and, and reorganize and rethink and, and, and rearrange and all that. And when you're doing that, the visuals are important. For instance, if I'm looking at a counter, which is dha, then, then, na, dha, then, then, that's the first, shasteen tal. Yeah. And on that first, I want to put things in there. So uh, let's say a square, dha, then, then, na, dha, 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 then, na, dha, ke, then, then, triangle, te, re, kit, then, na, dha, then, then, na, a line going like this, like an Egyptian, uh, whatever you want to call it, dha, then, hieroglyphics, dha, then, then, na, te, te, ge, ge, na, ke, na, ke, then, na, then, na, dha, then birds flying, na, na, I mean, there are visuals. So you think about those already. So when you're doing that, the next step is expressiveness in terms of thinking about happiness. So, romance. Right? Or uh, anger. Certain phrases lend to a certain emotion. So all these ideas were, are already embedded into the music, into the tabla. What the artists shied away from in, in, in performances is they did not recite. Um. When the tabla players performed in the old days, if you hear very old recording, they are not mm -hmm. reciting. They're just playing. And, and for a layman, uh, you know, not the you know, connoisseurs or students of tablas and so on, they could hear the emotive quality of the phrases and compositions. But for a layman, it was just information, rhythm, time being beaten. And, 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 and they're seeing it happen and, and, and reveling in the technical expertise of the maestro. That recitation ability came into play recently when the Maharajas let go of the artists and the artists moved to public uh, stages. And then in order to get the audiences involved, they started reciting things. So Ustad Tirakwa Khan Sahab started to recite. Ustad Amir Hussain Khan Sahab started to recite. Okay. Habibuddin Khan Sahab, Pandit Kanthe Maharaj. They, recite, they started to recite. Then they started to find things that actually explained. Uh, and, and the idea of rhythm and of time, but being beaten in a way that related to the daily life of the listener. So if you were in Banaras, you were listening to Ganesh Stuti. So, and then Kishan Maharaj used to do so well as do that and perform it on the tabla that came from Bade Ram Sahai Ji and Pandit Kanthe Maharaj Ji and so on down and but passed on. It, it would be great if, if you could show us how that transposes to the tabla, this idea, this connection of parhant and the bowls and the language mm -hmm. as being an emotive way of expression, expressing percussion and rhythm and beating time. Yes. How the two connect? How, how does, how does what, what you do orally and verbally connect to what you do with your fingers? There's, there's a there's an umbilical okay. cord between, you know, these two. Well, things. I have to say that this brings me to, you know, Lucknow. Okay. Okay, so Khalifa Wajid Hussain Khan Sahab and, 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 and his father and grandfather and so on, mm -hmm. they were at the court of Nawab uh, uh, Wajid Ali Shah. Okay, and uh, Abid Hussain Khan Sahab and so on. Sorry, I had Wajid Ali Shah. And who else was there? Bindadeen Maharaj. Yeah, right. Huh? the grand, great-grandfather of uh, Birju Maharaj Ji and so on. And, uh, connection. Now the tabla player is going to accompany, that great master is going to accompany Bindadin Maharaj Ji doing a bhao tumri. 
Yeah. Right? So, so now the bhav is being showed. Right? रंग रंगीली रसीली छबीली ब्रिज नार वो तो नैन के सैन से मारत बान रंग रंगली रसीली छबीली ब्रिज नार अब अब बंदा दीन महाराज इज शोइंग भाव नव इन द भाव इज बींग शोन एंड द बान इज बींग हिट एंड ऑल दैट स्टफ दैट इज बींग एक्सप्रेस इन द तबला बिकॉज दैर इज नो अदर इंस्ट्रूमेंट दस जस्ट लहर आ गोइंग ऑन सो the expressive instrument to amplify magnify the bhava coming from the dance is coming from tabla so the tabla players of those times started to find ways to be able to express that bade ram sahai ji studying in lucknow took that art of tabla playing to banaras and then the banaras kathak gharanas in evolved pandit sukhdev maharaj sitara devi ji's father mm-hmm. and so on and they took the ingrained uh language that was already being practiced and being held in high esteem by the layman which are shlokas padas stutis and imported all that into kathak and kathakars yeah. but that's where they started the ram navmi and started to do uh stories of rama and 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 ravana and what not and dasha avatars and all that stuff so tabla players and pakhavash players had to find a way to be able to help express that ability so that's where the shlokas came into play in the tablas so so zakir so zakir for somebody like me who's an absolute idiot until you show me something show me something how did it work uh, what 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 did tabla players do to be able to move a uh, with uh, kathakas with kathak dancers in the way that you describe how how okay. did, how did it change how did this normal team style well, beat change what happened well the expressive ability came into play that was already in the padhant which i was going to get to but yeah, yeah. uh when they started your company dance i think the idea dawned on the tabla players that hey you know this katha uh, is reciting these compositions and the audience is enjoying it maharaja is enjoying it nawab yeah. is enjoying it everybody is having fun with it i could do something like that i have the ability to recite my bowls i can put a ex- expression into it so uh so that happened now for instance a dance composition dhadagadha katha ke ke din nagadet composition as play simple beat time 13 now if i explain that krishna comes home late and radha very angry with him goes dhir dhir gadgada it's a question where were you did i get it and he, he says just not with friends kata ke ke then and then she says to him but you've got some you know little lipstick here and there in so where did that come from so nagadet te gintaran da nagadet te gintaran da so when he says nagadet te tegintaran ta is a question so how do you make a question mark nagadet te tegintaran ta so the bayam moves forward and so that thought is so if i am explaining this then it makes sense to the audience if i'm just playing it then it's a composition ah well played over done yeah, yeah. so and then she says get out of my heart so uh that happens so where were you with friends kata gege din but you've got all these live and i got it and he just got one nothing that they got and that you go so the composition when explained makes the expressive signs similarly when you have the shrutis i mean uh, shlokas and you have gana nama ganapati 
लंबो दरसो है भुजाचार एक तंत्र द्रमा लड़ाच लाल ब्रह्मा विष्णु महेश ताल दे धुरपत गाय अति विचित्र गणनाथ आज मृदंग बजाए सो थिंग्स लाइक दैट नट वर नाचत चपल चाल चंचल सखी थी रिकत धतित धतित था छोम छ न न न नाचत राधा कृष्णा सो दीज नेम्स दिस सिलेबल्स दीज आइडियाज आर ऑलरेडी देर एंड दीज वर देन इंपोर्टेड फ्रॉम वेरियस इंफ्लुएंसेज by the tabla players and so tabla evolved and therefore the expressive element evolved the vocal music comes into play because you not only had to accompany the dancers you had to accompany uh uh jatan bai goharjan uh, uh you know siddeshwari yeah. devi all those and they th- were queens of thumri and dadra and 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 uh, so you had to find a way to be able to be expressive in that element so you had to learn you had to know the repertoire as it is uh, very true in the western world as well if you want to be a classical musician you learn everything that all composers over the last 250 years have written and 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 similarly with jazz you learn all the standards and 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 so that you have it and uh, John McLaughlin said once that learn every chord, every phrase, every riff that that is out there in the world. Go on the stage and put it behind you. That's just there to push you forward, and and so on. So uh, that was an important aspect of my life. When I arrived at Badi Gulamani Khan Sahib's house, I was what my mom. Uh, used to send me there because Badegulam Ali Khan Sahib's wife uh, and Badegulam Ali Khan Sahib had had adopted my mother as their daughter mm-hmm. so beti and, and and it was very important for my mother because you know she was this young lady who had been brought in from punjab into mumbai and had no clue what's happening in mumbai and there are these people who came from the same region that she did who to karen as their daughter and so she had somewhere to go to some person to hold their hand and 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 get her all her frustrations out and so on and everything so i was also <clears throat> going there so my duty was every sunday i would get on uh, 84 express the bus uh and in those days i had a uh, uh, a sheet in which the tablas were tied in and i would carry it on my shoulder and i would walk and then i would arrive down uh, at chopati area and from there take another bus bus up i think it was 103 that went up to hanging gardens and i would get off at that teen batti turn and then walk down uh, two blocks to uh, where khan sahab lived and i'd walk up and i'd be there and i'd say uh, okay beta betho and and he'd be lying down and on his city aram se and his swar mandal was right here and he'd be and he'd be singing that's what he did just like my father was reciting tabla all day i mean and this was singing and it was imp- and it, i just sat there in rapt attention listening to ragas and tumuris and and uh, everything i mean just uh, watching this incredible voice just make things happen and uh, and there was a little kadhai uh, a little like a bowl that sat on a table next to him in that there were pieces of chicken <laughs> well made bhunar chicken and, and every once in a while he he take a piece and i he would eat wipe his hand on the towel and then start playing his swar mandal again and and start singing again 
and when the mood was on him to have somebody accompany a taker he would look at me and i'd play taker for him right. and and at that at my age to be getting that kind of attention and blessing first from ustad ali akbar khan sahab then people like ustad vilayat khan sahab then people like bade gulam ali khan sahab i mean i mean really what did i do i mean to deserve this i mean i was i was a lucky kid. son of a gun i have to say <laughs> <You> <laughs> and <are. laughs> and uh, so that allowed and then he would talk to people people would come sit around and he'd explain to them ideas uh, of, of what he felt uh, when he was singing and 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 listening to that the information just going in there it didn't make sense then but it made sense later but most tabla players of that time were singers as well ustad yeah. Tarakwa Khan Sahib could sing. My father studied singing and therefore learned the material. So all the dhrupads uh, 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 were learned by my father in Punjab, and 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 other maestros like Tarakwa uh, Khan Sahib learned ragas and compositions yeah. and so on. And it dawned on me that it is important for me to know that because when when I got a chance to play with the senior dagers. Mm-hmm. in the house of uh, jagirdar the actor yeah that was just on the corner of prabha devi near the uh, uh, siddhi vinayak <clears throat> a bung- the bungalow is still there and and you were what 13 i was 13 or so in the middle of yeah. the night a guy came to my house to the home in mahim and look asked for my father who was out performing somewhere and my mother innocently said well he's not there but my son is there you want to take him you can and <laughs> not realizing that there were senior doggers and i went and though they were so kind to me and they asked me if i could play this theka and that theka and i said yes and they sang accordingly but the thing is having that information of my father talking to me about dhrupads you know uh that uh, those were very important yeah, yeah. but if i ram ram chadho ranveer ranveer ghagad lanka ko drupad aur taad suran ke beg dam ko gyan all you know beautiful sul uh, taal uh, drupads and so on were but, already but in my mind but right, if i remember right if i remember right what they actually did on that day was because you were so young they actually i think switched to khayal they did they switched to khayal but having that information of drupad Absolutely. i did not feel uh, hesitant i yeah. i thought that i could do it and but they were kind enough to go to khayal and that sitting around with bade gulam ali khan sahab and keeping theka yeah. came in good stead there but later on when i was got getting older and i was accompanying people like uh, girja devi or shobha guru to uh, uh, and 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 so on the great artists like pandit jasraj ji or bhim sen ji and so on the expressive element that i had learned yeah watching bade gulam ali khan sahab and uh, <clears throat> how to put that into play was very important Yeah. and it it helped uh uh you know uh hey ram to pe vari na maru bhar pich kari ram to pe so this particular bhav tumri <coughs> in bhair bhai how to accompany it oops you want to drink because some water zakir you have some water next <coughs> i am keeping my bottle with me yeah you're have making a, me a, talk so a, much have a swig So while now, he's if a, while he's having a swig, let me tell everybody <coughs> that when Zakir is saying, "As I grew older," he's now reached about fourteen or fifteen. It's not as somewhere in that neighborhood. Older. Yeah. So <laughs> just to clarify, that's what he means about uh, when I grew older. Okay. Yeah, but uh, having played, having watched my father play with Birju Maharaj or Sitara Devi, you know, Sitara Devi danced on my first birthday <laughs> in our home. my f- oh, uh, yeah and uh, and uh, on my fourth birthday there was my father would organize a big deal you know the first son in the family uh, you know i don't know why the daughters were forgotten <coughs> but the son you know they would parade me around the mohalla with garlands in, in <laughs> my neck you know like i've done something incredible being born or whatever and <coughs> 
On my fourth birthday <coughs> in Mahim, there was this place called the Shafi Mansion. And on the bottom, there was this big hall uh, which could seat maybe 200, 300 people on the floor. And he arranged a little concert for me. And, I'd, and, and so the concert began with uh, Ustad Bade Gulam Ali Khan Sahab singing. And then the next item was Pandit Ravi Shankar, who performed. And after Pandit Ravi Shankar, there was this young waif of a young man dancing, Pandit Birju Maharaj, in those days. I mean, he was in his teens then, and he danced. And then after he danced, the night was closed by Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahab. <laughs> no organizer in the world or in India oh could God. get these four on the stage back to back like that. And, and to have that in, on my birthday, I mean, it, it's, it's just amazing. But watching that, watching the information and all of them were accompanied by my father. Mm -hmm. And to, to see that and, uh, and watch how different each accompaniment was. was. And, and to expressive level, and then going to Sitara Ji's class myself when I got older, uh, in, when I was 13, 14, and, and, and accompanying <clears throat> her class, or accompanying Bibi Bai's class, whose house my mother sent me to, where she was my mother's best friend, and, and I don't know why she sent me there, I mean, her, Bibi Bai was a Kathak dance teacher, and her daughter was a dancer, and, and, and I, I was like dance heaven, accompanying, da -da -da -da, playing for hours, no problem. So that upbringing helped me with the expressive element, like I was just well, explaining in those compositions. I think uh, one of the things must have happened as you began to become a versatile accompanist, I think the idea of the gharana being a fantastic training ground, but also being a trap. Yeah. I think that when did you begin to realize that, that I cannot remain uh, faithful? I, well, that, that infidelity was the way you wished to go. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, I think the beginnings were right here when I was like 13 or 14 years old and I was sent off to B.B. Bai's home and, and I would move off to Sitara Ji's class or Yep. or uh, whatever classes were happening there. And, and then uh, I was asked by students who were learning from these maestros to go perform with them. So I would end up in small little mohalla concerts. And in those concerts, I would come in touch with other musicians. And, uh, and, and, and play with them or get to know them. Uh, I would go to Lachu Maharaj's class in Dada, uh, the, uh, the uncle of Birju Maharaj. Yeah. And I would accompany, and then I was, I was once brought to accompany Shabu Maharaj's workshop in, in uh, I think it was somewhere near Pali Hill, Linking Road was still being formed in those days, uh, uh, the actress Kum Kum's house. <laughs> Okay, and and all these actresses and all were there, and Shambhu Maharaj was teaching uh, them kathak and bhao and everything, and I was accompanying, and and he would use some choice uh, four-letter words to uh, you know to to describe the way these ladies were dancing, and 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 correct them uh, harshly, and and all that was going on, but watching all that and learning all that. Uh, uh, I was already in my mind without trying to expanding whatever information I had on the tabla and, and connecting it to all this other information that mm -hmm. was coming my way. And, and, and what I mean by that is uh, I'm talking about first layer, which is nikas. So first I take the information that I have already from my father mm -hmm. and then see how it lends itself to, if played a certain way, to dance. So if I'm playing ta ta thai, tik da tik tik thai, now those are dance syllables, but I've got to execute that on my tabla. So how am I going to do that? That part. So I had to find the nearest possible f uh, f sounding phrase to that information. Ta ta thai, tik da tik tik thai. 
सो वॉट इज दैट फॉर मी इज तत्न खेतर गिट तक था सो इज तबला सिलेबस बट टू फाइंड दोज सो दैट काइंड ऑफ निकास दैट आईटी हेज ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड टू ब्रेक मी अवे फ्रॉम द ट्राइड एंड ट्रू फ्रेजियोलॉजी ऑफ पंजाब घराना that that you you combine this this way and that that way and no other way so that sh- those shackles had to somehow break for me to be able to accompany <clears throat> i did not give it a second thought because i said well i have to do it or else how am i going to play with these people yeah i and so that's going to happen so uh that's where it first began and then in one of the concerts that i was playing with my father when i was like 15 or 16 years old and we played a duet and we got off the stage and uh, one of my father's friends came up and said to him khan saab kya baat hai aaj to kamal bajaye aap aur aapka ladka zakir bilkul aapki tarah baja raha hai he's playing just like you and my father said well i hope he doesn't play like me i hope he finds his own way in the tabla and and that statement i suddenly looked at him okay. and yeah. i said is he really saying that does this mean that i've been given carte blanche that i can now go out and do what i want because till that point i was listening to thirakwa khasab i was going to his concerts i was listening to shamta prashad ji or kishan maharaj ji i was listening to sharda sahai and i was listening to nizamuddin khan sahab and so many other great maestros there and 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 learning all that information but i dare not play it on stage because i didn't want my father to know that yeah. i was doing that but him having said that it suddenly dawned on me that i did not have to play tere kita exactly the way he plays it or he has taught me that i can substitute the way thirakwa khan sahab plays tere kita or when nizamuddin khan sahab plays tere kita or shamta prasad ji plays tere kita and at that and i suddenly realized by doing that by that slight adjustment i could play compositions of farukhabad i could play compositions of lucknow or banaras and so on and though and then the nikas of that information was certainly becoming easier and, so how, and did, how how zakir <coughs> does the nikas change with these because very often it's similar in terms of goal and yet the way the singers <coughs> work on the instrument makes it very mm-hmm. different and very okay often, for what happens is that uh, one gharana may not be suited for a certain kind of singing style or a certain kind of dance style perhaps mm. i don't know you you tell me how how <coughs> how okay. do you mix and match how do you what do you do uh well i for instance a phrase that's very common in tabla and very well known tere kita so if i'm playing tere kita punjab style so it's three fingers four finger flat and back to three fingers okay so now i'm playing every combination that that can give me so all that stuff now i can do dha tari kit tak 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 tari kit tak tak tari kit tak tak tari kit do all that stuff but if i want to play dha tere kit tere kit tere kit play three tere kit as in a row then my problem is tere kit now i have to double this so so that is stuff to do fast doubling it so what do i do i mean i can do it but it's not fluent mm-hmm. but if i went to lucknow or farakabad they play tere kita with fingers so instead of te re ti ta i'm playing te with the middle finger re with the four finger ti as usual and ta with the ring finger te re ti that allows me to play multiple tere kitas in a row tere kita tere kita tere kita so i'm not doubling on any of the fingers yeah. so i can go tere kita tere kita tere kita i can do that now that i couldn't do playing punjab yeah so just that revelation alone opened up 5000 different possibilities absolutely 
you know and uh, uh, something that my father used to play a lot in punjab they do which is dena which is dena, dena, dena. and he does a lot of that and he's known for that like like all that now so play that my hands are cold right now so it's not warmed up but <clears throat> in other gharanas they play instead of dena dena they play dena gain so they, so one dena and then instead of another dena they transfer the din to gain on the baya so dena gain rather than dena dena so now having that available to me so i could actually get rest because playing dinner then continuously would tire me out or my hands get tight but if i was to slip in a din again in between i'd be a happy person so so just switching that brought me a whole load uh, of compositions of these other karanas that i could certainly play so instead of da get na ka tak te dikete tin tin ta ke na ka tak te dikete tin tin my father's very famous rela so doing that but if i wanted to play instead of tere ki tak tere ki i could go i was able to switch those tere ki tas in there so that's not punjab but this is a punjab rela punjab ro yeah, played with but i switch so i added another another idea to it Mm-hmm. and so these kind of things started to come to my head and and i started to find my way into being able to <clears throat> what should i say have more versatility yeah. more choice <coughs> <coughs> more choices available to me so if i was accompanying a kajri sung by girja devi i could accompany her that way yeah. i mean I, if if she was singing uh uh uh, uh hori rang darungi ha rang darungi if she singing that i am thinking gudai maharaj samta prasad ji banaras so uh, you know he we play baya with the maidan the longer side of it towards us so okay. that there's room for the wrist to sit Gudai Maharaj ji was an original in baya playing because he switched it so the sh- short end of the maidan was to his side so so that allowed him to get a better attack but also allowed him with just a just a certain slide very little movement but mm-hmm. allowed him that little uh, uh, leeway and change of yeah. mood so suddenly he's accompanying rang so if i was playing my way rang his way rang so suddenly that banaras tilt yeah. lilt a uh, jhol as it is comes into the rhythm so these kind of little ideas one sentence i hope he plays like himself i hope he does something different than me because allah rakha is already done yeah so there's as, no point as, in doing allah rakha yeah. as you were as you were becoming more and more accepted and popular as zakir hussain the tabla accompanist i think two things happened and i'm wondering how that affected your tabla playing one of course was that your audiences increased and therefore you have probably had to take in that idea of the audience and in our music um certainly at a time that was a very important idea when people said wah wah and how they gave daad was an important idea and the other thing i think uh-huh. is that that senior musicians began to trust you even though you were so much younger so how did these two ideas change perhaps the way you were accompanying one is 
the idea of paying for larger audiences. And the second is playing with senior musicians who had trust in the fact that you would be able to accompany them. Well, first of all, I have to say I had my share of, uh, uh, you know, playing for the clapping. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did my, I, my share of one-upmanship and trying to, you know, just play the way I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. I was 16, I think. I got a chance to go on a four concert tour with Pandit Ravi Shankar. Okay. So it was Mumbai, Hyderabad, I think Chennai and Cochin, Kochi. Okay. So I played with him in Mumbai at Chan Makanand Hall. And I thought I played well because every time I did something, the audience clapped. So I played well. I mean, the criteria I played well was that the audience clapped. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, got on the plane with the Raviji a couple of days later and I was sitting with him. He was busy with his magazines and newspapers and stuff. And I thought that he would say something about the concert, but he didn't. He never did. So I was like, hmm, maybe it was, and you know, I'm looking for some recognition from him, some acknowledgement, <clears throat> nothing happened. <clears throat> so we ended up in uh, Hyderabad. In those days, you to fly those Dakotas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we were in Hyderabad. Uh, concert, I played. I thought the concert well, well, went really well because the audience is clapped. Yeah. <clears throat> Next day, we flew off to Chennai, Madras. And I'm sitting next to him. He still hasn't said anything. So I very hesitantly said, Uncle, the concert was nice, <laughs> wasn't it, the other day? It was quite good. Uh, and, and, and he said, hmm, you didn't say much more. And then, but after a while, he saw me fidgeting and he understood that I needed some, some nod on his part. So he looked at me and said, Zakir, do you remember any phrase or any Tihai or any melodic idea that I played from the concert? <clears throat> I couldn't think of anyone. I had no idea what he had done, but I knew what I had done. I knew everything that I had played and I knew which, what I had played that brought more applause but I didn't know what he had done. So it was interesting to me that he would ask that question and then he would, then he expanded further and said, so, uh, okay, do you even remember the color of kurta that I was wearing yesterday? And I couldn't, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what he was wearing because I was sitting, looking at the audience and he's over there so I'm like, okay, I'm going to play for the audience. That guy is really enjoying my playing. I'm going to focus on him and I'm really going to do my thing. That Sheikh Daud Khansab's son and, and Shabir, and I'm going to concert, concentrate on him and, and, you know, and so. So I, this guy, he can do whatever he wants. I'll play take off and whatever, but okay. I wasn't paying attention. So he said, you have no idea what I did. You never once looked at me. You didn't lock your eyes with me. And so you had no clue what I wanted, when I wanted. And you had no idea what dynamics to deal with. He used the word dynamics to deal with at that time. I didn't know what dynamics meant at that time, but he used that word. <clears throat> so, and then he looked at me and said, it's a conversation. We are playing together. We are talking to each other. You're talking in the tabla language, I'm talking in the sitar language. We are connecting. So why shouldn't you look at me? So why shouldn't we talk to each other as well as so that the audience can hear us talk to each other and, and make sense of what we are saying? Yeah. I thought about that. And, you know, that day we didn't have a concert, but next day I thought about it. And, and it made sense to me. And, and, and it was his bidding, through his bidding, that I change my sitting position from sitting straight looking at the audience to an angle so that I was now looking at him. And that alone changed everything. 
I mean, he, he didn't have to tell me how to accompany, but just to, watching him, I could suddenly hear, you know how it is, you might not listen yeah. very well in your ear, but when you're watching someone's lips speaking to you, you can tell what that person is saying. Yeah. It's, it's clear to you. And, and, and so suddenly the music coming at me was clear. And, and because of that clarity, it was clear to me what I was supposed to do. Because I had that information already from watching my father play with him, from watching my father play with Vilayat Khan Sahib and me playing with the dancers and, and, and singers and everything. It was clear to me what yeah. was required of me. I just wasn't doing it because I was just too involved in myself. Yeah. And just that one little hint, that one little suggestion, uh, just changed my way of thinking. And suddenly I was not worried about who was sitting in the audience and was I supposed to pay attention to them or play for them. It became clear to me that I was going to have a conversation with this yeah. person. Fabulous. And, yeah. and that uh, a revelation, uh, it, it just changed my life as an accompanist. It made me comfortable with the idea that instead of having applause every time I did my utans, just having it once is enough. Fabulous. Uh, and Great you know, story. it was clear. And, and the more the years went by, I became more and more comfortable with the idea <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that I'm going to accompany this person and, and whatever this person wants done, we will do. And I'm sure if I give the audience the credit of their intelligence to be able to decipher whatever it is that we are doing yeah. and therefore see the, the worth in it, see uh, the good and the fab, everything in it, and, and applaud that at the end is very important. Absolutely. I have to mention here that my years that I spent with Ustad Ali Akbar Khan sir, in California, right here, and uh, all over the world, traveling with him and playing with him, away from the scrutiny of the connoisseurs and the critics and everything from India, yeah. <clears throat> helped me immensely to actually solidify this idea of accompaniment. I was we'll, not worried about it. Yeah. We'll yeah, I was not worried about the audience. Mm. Go ahead. You know, just as so Dakota Dakota flights have their uses. Just just as you were getting audience friendly, you were understanding the idea of dynamics, you were uh, getting into the mode where you were an exceptional accompanist, you decided to up and go. Yeah. Why? Why? Well, I actually went for two weeks or three weeks to Europe to play concerts with Ashish Khan. Ali Akbar Khan Sahib's son. And we were going to tour Europe and I was going to come back home. That was the plan. While we were in Europe, I get a call from Ravi Shankarji. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in Germany. And he says, your father is not feeling well. He's not going to be able to come to New York and play these set of concerts that I have coming up. So uh, I have discussed with Ashish, you go to the American embassy in, in Munich get a visa, your ticket is organized, get on the flight and uh, come to New York and, and you're playing these concerts with me. In those days, an uh, as, as 18, 17, 18 year old kid could walk into an American embassy, give his passport and say, I want a visa. And they will say, for how long? <laughs> Not, you didn't have to present this many papers or anything or a ticket or anything you didn't you just how long and 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 so i was given a six month visa and i boarded a flight and i arrived in new york and uh, i played with ravi shankarji in new york at the fillmore east uh, uh under the banner of bill graham productions <clears throat> And then another concert in Philadelphia and another in Washington and so on. But through these concerts, Ashish and, and, and Raviji were in contact and Ashish flew back to Los Angeles. And <clears throat> there was this job offer at the University of Washington, Seattle to teach 
at the ethnomusicology department. Yeah. They thought they could bring in a tabla teacher. And, and so Ravi Shankarji felt that this was a good opportunity for, my, for me to go teach there as well as, you know, have education myself, being on the campus in the university and learn. So he talked to my father and they agreed that that would be a good idea. So I was packed off to the University of Washington, Seattle. And next thing I know, uh, a year and 11 months or so later, I came to India. I was gone that long because during that period, I played with Ashish and taught in University of Washington. Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sahib was in San Francisco. So Seattle to San Francisco was an hour yeah. and some flight. And his tabla maestro, Shankar Ghoshji, was leaving for India because he wanted to bring up his son, Bikram Ghosh, uh, in India. And, uh, and, and I sometimes would uh, come to the Bay Area and hang out and, you know, see Khan Saab and so on, and, you know, just on my time off. Yeah. So on one of those occasions, Ali Akbar Khan Saab asked me, said, why don't you come and teach at the college? I mean, Neki or Pooch Pooch. I mean, it was yeah. like, you know, there were tabla players in, in, in India lined up and they would give their right thumb to be able to come and teach at Ali Akbar Khan Saab. And I was being offered the job. And I quickly <laughs> chucked my job in University of Washington and flew out to the Bay Area and, and took assignment with, with the Khan Saab school. And with that came the added benefit of being his accompanist yeah. and traveling and playing concerts with him. And, and he uh, was another one of those guys who through his music spoke volumes, taught a tabla player volumes of information. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to accompany him and see him, he was one of those musicians who took a leap of faith every time he performed. I have to, uh, let me explain that a little bit. Most musicians, yours truly included, arrive on the stage with, with the comfort zone in mind that we have a portfolio of information ready to put on the stage. You know, I know this is what the audience likes. This is what the audience likes. This is what the audience likes. So I'm gonna, you know, play those with a little adjustment here and there, but largely stick to the routine. Any, everybody, I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm saying this, instrumentalists, yeah. dancers, tabla players, all. The one area this doesn't necessarily apply is khayal singing. It does not apply there, mm -hmm. but it does apply in other elements. And so we would have all this information. Ali Akbar Khan Sahib was the one who did not worry about falling flat on his face, looking horrible one day, looking out of sorts one day, in the pursuit of trying to find something new, in the pursuit of being different every day. I mean, you have to realize that the music is born early in the morning if the day is years. It lives through the day and at night it dies after it's done with, it dies. Next day, another incarnation of music would take place. If that is the thought process you live with, then you are on the verge of being a creative genius and you are ready to be able to take that leap of faith, try something different. So Ali Akbar Khan Saab, universally acknowledged one of the greatest musician of India. Yeah. And uh, he would perform 10 concerts. Two of those or three of those concerts would be incredibly memorable. Things that you would take to your grave with you, that, that you were there and you saw that. But the other six or seven would verge on average or really bad. <laughs> I have to say this, I've seen this because, yeah. not because he was not a good musician, it was because he was looking for something to do. On that day, it did not come, but it did not deter him. He just kept trying. Yeah. If things kept failing, he just kept trying. Critics used to say, he looks like he's practicing on stage. 
they failed to see that he was trying to find something new to offer to the audience. And, oh, and, yeah. and that's, that's what it was. And, and that is another revelation that helped me tremendously. Mm -hmm. I had no problem. Uh, once you said that to me and, I, and, and, and resonated to me, uh, the word threatened. I did not feel threatened anymore. Mm -hmm. I could get on stage and I could just do what I felt I needed to do. And what I felt the main artist wanted me to do. Audience was not involved. Nothing was important. That threat of, oh, I need to do something that would make me appealing to them yeah. was not there anymore. I spent many concerts playing with Ali Akbar Khan Sahib, just playing Teka. 45 minutes, one hour, just playing Teka. And uh, because that's all that was required. Yeah. I, it wasn't required for me to play a T high or go brrr, blah, 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 no. So I didn't. It was fine the way it was. But I could do that because I was traveling all over the world with him playing for non-Indian audiences. So therefore, that kind of pressure of being Zakir Hussein on stage mm -hmm. was not there. And, and, and so over the years, this kind of uh, thought process uh, developed. It didn't just happen one day, but that landmark moment with Ravi Shankarji and those years with Vilayat Khan, uh, Ali Akbar uh, Khan Ali Akbar. Sahib, uh, really shaped uh, my thinking as an accompanist and my, uh, and my, how should I say, confidence level mm -hmm. uh, in having the confidence in the audience to see the value in whatever it is that I'm putting out. Zaki, you know, when you talk about being shaped, I go back in time a bit because when you left uh, Bombay to go to uh, the US, you were really a Mahin kid and perhaps a Simla House uh, kid. Yeah, and a couple of years world, in Simla House. Yeah, so you were not a man of the world when you actually no. and you took this on quite, quite quickly. And I go back to an idea that prepared you both for the world as well as for the tabla and its place in the world. But it came, I think, from two, from a conflict. And that mm. conflict is between your mother and your father. Uh -huh. actually. Because I think your father prepared you for the tabla, but it was your mother who prepared you for the world. Yes, and, absolutely. And what was that conflict between education and riyaz that you had to deal with when you were a young kid? Uh, and how well, did the that conflict, prepare you? How did that prepare you for this new life that you were going to take you on? You know, I've thought about this more and more. I've thought about why my mother wanted me to be educated or why my mother wanted my sisters to be educated. Why it is that we were the first family in that mohalla yeah. to have kids going to school. And, 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 why, and it was looked upon, you know, in a negative uh, shade, I mean, uh, by the rest of the mohalla uh, ladies and gents. Uh, but <coughs> I think <coughs> it was her need first. I mean, she was a Punjabi girl, a young lady, illiterate, had no way to read or write or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Later on, she figured some things out and was able to then read the Urdu paper slowly. But in the beginning, it was like that. And when my father started traveling a lot, she would wait for some message to come from him, some letter, some postcard, anything. Because it was, you know, this, you know, her, her what should I say, uh, connection to some sort of reality, some sort of yeah. uh, security blanket, whatever you want to call it. And uh, But when the letters would come, there was nobody to read it to her. Mm. It was a heartbreaking moment, you know, yeah. for her to go looking around and finally arrive at the post office and ask the postman or somebody to read it to her. There was this stranger who was party to this inner emo emotional conversation between her and her husband. And mm -hmm. that 
just that, I think that need alone was so huge in her that I think th that already made her think that my kids should go to school. I have not been able to do it, but they should go to school so they could read these letters to me, that they could do this for me. And, 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 and that started it. But as my father kept coming back and forth and going back and forth, she realized one day that I'll be doing the same thing. And because I will be doing the same thing, she saw uh, that my father was not able to communicate well. He had to find somebody there in America to write the letter for him, yeah. to, to figure out what kind of postage stamp and to mail it. All that had to be done. She did not want that dependence to be on me. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and she felt that it was important that I study and that I go to school. Somehow she figured out that going to an Urdu medium school or the madrasa is not going to teach me that. That I had to go to a school where this language called English was taught. How extraordinary and, and how, how sort of thoughtful of her in, in terms of your future. And, and you, you are where you are thanks to that idea. Yes, she Absolutely. is largely responsible for the way I shaped up. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so she found through some way to, and brought me to this school and St. Michael's High School and, and begged them to accept me. And somehow pennies, pennies, pennies collected enough money every month. It mm -hmm. was just like 12 rupees or something a month to be able to pay my fee and to get my books and to get me that canvas bag to carry my books in, you know, and, and, and uh, the uniforms and whatnot, and just to be able to do the school. And then she realized that if Zakir starts traveling, my daughters have to be able to read the letters. So she sent them to school. And, but the thing is, she couldn't send them to the English school because that would be being a little too much for the mohalla rebellion. Mohalle ki ladki Catholic school mein jayegi, kya ho hai? Mm. What's the world coming to? That kind of stuff. So she sent them to Urdu medium school, uh, and uh, uh, where they also taught a little bit of English in the Urdu medium school, but Urdu medium school. But those my sisters were the first two young ladies in the mohalla to go to school. Most of my friends growing up there uh, were the kids of the Panwala and the Mithaiwala and the Poolwala, or the ones who provided flowers for the Darga, which was right there. And, uh, and, and that's what they did. They went and sat at, the, the, at their father's shops and, and helped out and, yeah. and therefore learned the trade. And, and it wasn't the same for me. And I went to school. And uh, so, uh, so this is uh, something that she came up with. She thought of. She worked hard to make it happen. Yeah, and, we, and, uh, we salute her for, for this kind of idea. Absolutely. I salute uh, her day in and day out, I tell you. But I think one other thing happened, Zakir, and we bring in another woman into your life, is that you got married. I did get and, married, yes. And you got married to Tony, who comes from a completely different upbringing to what you grew up in, and was mm. exposed to a completely different music. <laughs> so she later became a, a Kathak dancer and got into the Indian fold. But mm -hmm. when you met her, that I don't think was so true. So what kind of music did she, uh, an influence, particularly musical influence, did she bring into your life? Because that relationship started very early on when you went to America. Yeah. I think uh, in my second year I was here in America, uh, uh, I met Tony and, 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 and that word met uh, what was permanent, obviously. And uh, so, uh, so we've been married now about 42 years and uh, 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 our kids have grown up, I, we are grandparents and all that stuff. Congratulations. But when I, I met her... I must tell the audience that he had to marry her thrice. But I had to marry her thrice, yeah. In the same year, I had to marry her thrice. Uh, so we'll get to that later. <laughs> but 
what was interesting, I think she saw in me was I was not like the usual Indian musician uh, that she had seen. I was this young man who had wide eyes for information uh, and, 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 and let me, let me, let me, let me have it, let me have it, that attitude. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, she turned me on to Rolling Stones. She turned me on to Laura Nero. Uh, uh, I mean, Traffic, uh, so many rock and roll bands and yeah. stuff and, uh, and so on. And, and, and that had been, but what was more interesting to me was, and, and more important for my life was that, you know, when I wasn't working at the Ariyakpa College, I wanted to strike out on my own. <coughs> uh, and yet looking for where the next paycheck is going to come from, because that's what you, you're used to. But her attitude was very different. Her attitudes at that time was like my father's attitude used to be when, when we were young and, and, and there would be very little money and he would say to my mother, don't worry, Allah dega, God will give. And lo and behold, a day or two later, some concert would come yeah. and somebody would come with a, some advance saying, here's the advance and the concert is next yeah. month, whatever. And boom, so that would happen. So uh, uh, she had that attitude you want to go work with this guy fine go ahead and do it you don't want to teach at the college fine do it it's okay we'll manage and 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 that kind of support uh uh behind me because being an indian and used to oh we have to have money we have to have money they have to have money that's security yeah. uh but to have a partner in your life who was open to that idea who was say, yeah, go do, do this, go do that, go play with this person, go play with Armando Peraza, go play with, yeah, yeah, expand, go do that. Oh, it's not gonna pay you, but that's okay. At least it'll start something. It'll, it'll get some the ball rolling, whatever. To have that kind of uh, backing behind you, to that kind of belief in your ability, my ability, that I can cut it in this world. Yeah that I can make my way in this world. And it's okay if we have to just boil some pasta and put some butter on it and eat it. That's all right. Uh, it doesn't matter. So, uh, uh, you know, that kind of support and understanding was there from her. And, and, and when you have that available to you, uh, you don't hesitate to go out there and conquer the world. Uh, and, and, and you have no problem failing yeah. uh, 500 times. And uh, so that was there. And over the years, her influence has been very strong. Like, Zakir, you should work with Edgar Maya. He's a very fine yeah. musician because she herself is a musician. She plays yeah. the piano. She, she reads music. She knows all about that. She studied Eurythmics. She studied with Ali Akbar Khan Sahib. She studied mm -hmm. ragas, and 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 then of course she studied for thirty years with Sitara Devi, That's and right. and so she, uh, so her her understanding of both worlds is 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 in depth. It's 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 uh, on many layers. So that coming to me, I mean, quite a bit of like work with Alonso King. She said, and I said, who's Alonso King? He's a great contemporary ballet choreographer, and and you should work with him. You know, and, and brought that to me. And that has been an incredible experience. And it allowed me to compose for five full ballets for this man and, 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 and made it happen. Work with it, Edgar Meyer. He's a great composer, a great bassist, classical person. And how will I work with Western classical musician? Will he work with me? Yes, he will. Let's connect. So on and on. And that yeah. brought me the, into the world of writing for Western classical music, concertos and so on and et cetera. So it's we'll all come, her doing. Yeah, we'll come it's to all that her doing. later. I, I, what I thought that <laughs> she brought to you and America brought to you is the idea that you began to be open to the rhythms of the world. Yes. And it was not just being open to the rhythms of the world, but I think what was hugely interesting is that you began to transpose that information that came your way onto your instrument. Mm -hmm. And therefore that changed the way you approached your instrument, the way you played it, the way you looked at yeah. it, perspective change. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned 
Armando Perazza. And I want to come to that because uh, from what I remember, he was somebody who actually helped change the way you looked at your own instrument. Can we of talk course. a little about that? Can yeah, be, uh, that's the next. That know that story. Yeah, that's the next layer of Tony's influence because, uh, I mean, she was open to the idea of me going and working with all these people, and she would actually even, uh, you know, goad me into doing that, and 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 that uh, brought me to these people. But one of the persons that I connected with was Mickey Hart. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. so I had to have a stepping stone into that world. Mickey Hart has been that. Uh, stepping stone. He has been my friend for over 40 years now, and we've worked together uh, day in and day out. And uh, he had this barn in which he had built the studio. And in that studio, every day somebody showed up. Some musician would show up. One day it would be Carlos Santana, another day it would be Grace Lake of Jefferson uh, Airplane or David Crosby or, uh, I mean, you name it. These be Stephen Stills, people were just showing up. And, and, and Armando Peraza would come and uh, Ola Tunji, uh, Baba Ola Tunji, Hamza Eldin, the great Nubian percussionist, Oud yeah. player. He would come, so many great musicians would come. So his door, Entering that was like entering a portal uh, <laughs> yeah. and going through that and arriving in this world that was so different from the w world of Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Saab and me living in the Ali yeah. Akbar College environment. And uh, working with Mickey brought me in touch with some great percussionists. And Armando Peraza, who was the conguero maestro, with Carlos Santana, at that time was a was the master conguero player, and uh, and 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 he was playing congas, which were like five instruments. So the tumba, the congas, the quinto, various uh, versions of the conga drum. I didn't even know that they had separate names. I learned that, and they were all tuned. They were all tuned differently. And so he was not just playing rhythms. He wasn't just playing uh, the clave or the wa wa ko or martillo or whatever these rhythms are called from the, from the world of salsa, but he was voicing them harmonically. Yeah. So, so that was a revelation to watch. And, and, and I realize that he has to play these different instruments uh, to, in order to get that tonal differences going. But I, on my tabla, have tonal differences on various parts of my tabla. So why is it not possible for me to take that information and, and, and transpose it? So stuff like, say, the one of the most important element in salsa uh, uh, drumming, is Latin drumming, is the clave. What mm -hmm. is a clave? It's a two sticks that the main timekeeper has. And he plays the clave, which is this. On that little pattern that the, that the clave player plays, the whole salsa system is based. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting. So when, when, when the, I said, okay, why not if I have my tabla going, That's the clave. Mm -hmm. Now the big tumba and the conga were playing a pattern related to that clave. So, and that was boom, 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 boom. So that's the clave and that's the pattern. So, I mean, I can easily do it on my instruments by myself. So, here's the clave. Uh, uh, uh. So, 
So now I've got the tumbas and the conga going here and the clave pattern going there. It was easier to do. But my Indianness said, I must improvise and I must play around it and embellish it. And that's where transposing this yeah. and then injecting what I am all about into it. So it became... If you notice, it's not a straight keherwa. Yeah. It's not. It's not that. It's that pattern, yeah. and on that pattern is based all this a other stuff. And there is a jhol, a swing. Yeah. So it's not. That's straight, but the swing is. So it's like this. So just to be able to understand the swing, it's like when a dholak player plays uh, uh, with uh, uh, Jaddan Bai, for instance. Najar lagi hai pani ghatuva na jaye Na jaye, na jaye pani ghatuva na jaye So this is, you know, like a, like a kaharwa uh, uh, kajari kind of a thing yeah. and how the dholak player will play with that that chol it's, it's very important uh, a tabla player cannot do that unless he understands the culture, the tradition and so on, so I had to actually live in that environment and understand that culture understand the way of Chango the, the shamanic god that they all relate to and the chants that go with that, and the kind of understanding that they have in their prayers with these rhythms, and, 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 and how it relates to their day-to-day -day life, all that stuff is similar with us in, in, in India. And, 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 and what was beneficial for me, and also fortunate for me, was that in Latin world, they love to improvise. And in Tabla world, we love to improvise. So to have that common element already there and then understanding this so it allowed me to bring in and transpose what max roach the great drummer uh, jazz drummer would do with his jazz kit mm -hmm. and he had his toms toms tuned up properly and he'd play those and 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 he had the symbols of different sizes which if you paid attention sounded different and so all those melodic elements had to be there in place and, and play. So all that, and, and it allowed me to even consider uh, trying to find tonal uh, 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 yeah. uh, elements. So yeah. for me, dhati dhage te na gena, a phrase like that on tabla, was not just any more. It was, it had to have some kind of tonal expression. So instead of... I mean, I'm starting to get into that. And also, I, I think I figured out that one of the things important to the instrumentalist or a vocalist is to, when you're playing teka for them, that the teka should have landmarks. So, okay, okay and, and when the landmarks are there, then they understand where the sum is, where the kali is, and so on. Uh, similar idea to Latin percussionists, the clave, and then the conga is the la conga and tumba, the landmark. So th that is in one place and is in another place, but combined together, that creates a land, a picture, and not only a rhythmic picture, but a visual picture. So. I brought that element into my take up playing. So if I was playing teen tal, mo 
most of us double player would like to just show off how much elaboration we can do in it. The instrumentalist or vocalist doesn't need that. They need to hear simplified theka, which they will fill with the kind right. of ornamentation that they want yeah. to do. If they are doing ornamentation and you're also doing a thousand notes a minute, it's just too much of a jumbo. So that kind of understanding comes from learning Latin percussion or jazz drumming. Yeah, yeah. So when the five people playing together, you find your space in there and you stick to it. And, 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 and so that's important. So that's one thing. So I... Now I created a melody on the bio. I could... So now the artist knows that's one. And before that, there are two bayan notes. So, so. So now already, and that's a Banaras influence as well, but you create that and melodic elements come into play. So I can, gen, instead of playing dhati dhagena, dhati dhati dhagate nagena. What does that do? It shows a swing. At the same time, it, it paints a visual picture. So, so my body is doing the same thing. So what you hear, you see with the, it's some kind of a dance. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so talking to our earlier thing, parhant, expression, emotion, all that stuff and these elements being projected yeah. uh, and not only here on the surface of the instrument but all over so visually when you are presenting a concert it is essential that you tie the audience into the whole experience not just listening to this or watching your hands but also watching you yeah so just doing that. Now, when you do all this stuff, you're now, you're giving a picture yeah. to the audience. It's an audio visual experience. And, and, and that's what the parhant taught me. That's what expression, emotion, playing with dance, uh, hanging out with Tony, hanging out with Armando Peraza or uh, Max Roach or Elvin Jones, not hanging out with them, but hearing them and uh, Buddy Rich, all these great drummers and stuff. And all that information transposed into this uh, 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 gives me an idea of how many layers of information yeah. that this instrument can absorb. And, and right now it's an it's, uh, un uncountable number of layers and there's more out there. But you know, Zakir, we've seen your growth in this particular talk from your, when you were one and a half and reciting bowls mm -hmm. to where you have come, where you've imbibed and transposed world rhythms onto the tabla taken on your own information that you got as a child. So one would think that um, <laughs> that journey has been without any setbacks really in terms of its creative growth it seemed to have gone from one high to another and yet I, yet I, I i want to i want to bring that down to earth a bit because even somebody like you 
who has done so much with the instrument and so much with what you have been gifted with, have gone through bouts of huge self-doubt, at least mm -hmm. twice that we know of. And I want to talk about it because I think it's so important for artists tuning in, listening to this, that no, no journey is smooth sailing in the creative, on, on the creative sea that the boat is rocked. And what do you do when that boat is rocked? What happened to you? I, I really want you to talk about the idea of the chilla, because mm -hmm. that I think is not so well known part of your life. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, and for good reasons, because chilla is a very personal thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it's not just me alone that, uh, that has done chilla. All musicians uh, in, in the music world at one point or another are expected to go through that process. So yes, it is, uh, it is commonly uh, 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 you know, practiced in, in our world. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, only the chosen few get to do that. And those are the ones who are supposedly going to move forward and onwards and, and become the representative, uh, the flag bearers, if you will, of the art form. And, and, and to, to accomplish that, you must go through what they call the, I mean, you know, the, the test or the, the, uh, the challenge of, of, of showing that you are capable, that you have the ability and so on. For me, that came by accident because uh, I was a young man and, uh, quite happy with myself you know it, this is before i started to play with ravi shankar ji and got that yeah. incredible lesson <clears throat> maybe just a point before uh and uh, i got a bad review there used to be a, a, a critic a, 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 a music critic uh, for times and his name was mohan natkarni he himself had been a wannabe musician, <clears throat> didn't quite make it in that world. But uh, anyway, so he was a critic and yeah. uh, I'd been doing my, my thing. Uh, as I told you earlier, we all come with this portfolio of information yeah. and then and we lay all that out as and when required. So, and I was doing that as a 15 year old and, and having a ball. People were, you know, lapping it up and, you know, a young kid playing with all these, playing with Sitara Devi, playing with, uh, uh, yeah. you know, all these great musicians and so on. And wow, great. But uh, he felt, and, and, and he wrote that in his uh, review, and I have that framed in my home in India. And, uh, <laughs> and he said that Sakir is becoming stale. In, in a sense that he has not <clears throat> gone past a certain uh, level. I mean, we have all gotten used to the cuteness and all that and everything, and that's all done. Uh, but well, come on now, what's next? Where is it? And, and, and that next level, uh, I, he may have been a little, uh, I should say, a little too early in my life to give me that critic. But he did, nevertheless, and, 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 and I thanked, in my mind later, I thanked him because he gave that critic because he saw that I had the ability to move forward and I wasn't going forward. That he saw a spark inside of me and, 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 and he was desperate that I should see it and I should move forward with it. So the critic. and. Uh, but it, it made me start to think. First, there was anger. There was like, oh, I mean, what does he know anyway? And so on. And my friends, you know. And there used to be an English teacher in our school. His name was Mr. Oberoi. And he used to, from time to time, again, bring something and he would read to the class and then analyze the grammar of it, you know, break it down for us. He brought that review to class. <laughs> and he read it in class and he broke it down 
you know, an analysis of the grammar of it and, and so on and everything. <laughs> so, and my friends, of course, would pat my back and say, oh, don't worry about it. What does he know? He's not even a musician, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my father was upset about it. And I was too. But after a while, you know, my father was gone and I was like left to my own devices and I was like thinking about it. It bothered me, bothered me. I don't know why it dawned on me. Maybe he's got a point. Maybe mm. it is time I, you know, looked inside myself and, 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 and asked myself the question, do I have what it takes? Do I have that ability? Do I have the masala needed to make that curry? Uh, I didn't know. I mean, so that kind of made me want to go away and do the chilla. And usually you go to your teacher, you get your teacher's permission. And if yeah. the teacher feels that you are ready, he will tell you go. And he will give you a mantra that you would first chant for a very long time every day before you go into the practice. Chilla is actually a Persian word which relates to 40 days. The Sufis did that uh, in their lodges or wherever they were. So <laughs> the Indian musicians adopted the idea. And uh, uh, so you're supposed to be sent to the guru's ancestral place. It would be a small place where you would be by yourself, no connection with anybody, no contact with the rest of the world. Uh, food will be brought and left outside the door. You are left alone with your music. You go in there with an idea of something that you want to fix in your music, in your playing. And you concentrate on that. And that means 14 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours a day of just that. And, and what it does is when you are, you know how it is when you're playing Tanpura and you're in a room. And, and if only the Tanpura is playing after about 10 or 15 minutes of listening to just that, it kind of puts you in, in some kind of a sonic trance. Yeah. And, and, and you start to go in deeply in it. And if you focus on it, you can even see the fingers going from one string to the other, magnified. It's like watching a stone grow, meditation, right? So, uh, uh, so it's that, and, 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 and the vibrations and the frequencies of the music then get inside of you. And if you're doing it for 15, 16 hours with no outlet of any kind, no interaction of any kind, and you into it, it starts to get to a point where it, it starts to control your mind you start to hallucinate, you know, and, and then things happen, uh, you know, and the Native American Indians, Indians take LSD or peyote buttons or mushrooms and all. And when they go into these lodges and, and they experience, uh, 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 you know, an out of body experience. Yeah. And, and the, so similar thing, but this happens through the frequencies of the sounds of the music which does that. You know, it is commonly known that there are certain frequencies that can actually create hallucination inside of you or even harm you. Like for instance, a bass frequency of below 16 hertz. If you constantly are hearing it and you're near it, it will make you dizzy, it'll make you vomit, it'll make you throw up. There have been experiments made in America to find a weapon of that kind to be used on uh, uh, enemies, to, to project that kind of frequency. So frequencies are very interesting things. So uh, this happens. And if you've gone into the chilla with basically just nothing but positive energy inside of you, your experience can be very, uh, you know, revealing and it can be very uplifting and very positive. But if you have any negativeness inside of you, it can manifest in various things. So Sultan Khan once told me that he was doing his chilla and, and I guess he had had 
some arguments in the family and whatnot and everything. And he'd gone into the chilla and that negative energy was inside of him. And, and, and it got to a point where it was so crazy. And, and there was such horrifying thing that came at him that he just screamed and, 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 and his chilla was broken. So that can happen. For me, luckily, my father wasn't there. He didn't send me, but I went anyway. Uh, 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 there was nothing but positive inside of me so far, except for this one review. Uh, and, but my emotional engagement with anybody in the world uh, uh, around me had always been positive. It's good. And, and so I did not have any negative impact on me with that. But through the chilla and maybe around the 18th or 19th day or something, I did have hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because uh, in my hallucination, this uh, being, spirit, appeared. And, yeah. he, and he appeared to have taught me a composition. Because, I mean, I don't recall having learned the composition, yeah. but at one point it suddenly was there. And somehow it related to that being. And so anyway, I finished my chilla and, and, and I realized that potential inside of me. I could see that yes, I needed to grow and that yes, there was potential and that yes, yeah. I must take the chance with my life and move forward with all that stuff that I have inside of me. So that clarity came, some understanding of compositions on how to make that work further out and all that. I came home and I was home and then my father came back. My mother told him that I had gone off to some place. You, you've heard of Haji Malang? No, but I know that heard, Malang Baba's, uh, anyway. Go. Hat, it's up up there. And, and, and so behind the tome mm -hmm. are these little huts or something. And, and we've been there many times for ziyarat, as they say, to see, yeah. to, to pay respects. And, and so that's where I went, in one of those huts behind there. And, 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 and so when I came back, I was there and my mother told my father when he came back that this happened. My father was very upset, very angry. And, 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 and he didn't say, when he was angry, he wouldn't say a word. He'd just walk up and down. And, 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 and da, da, da. But anyway, so then he talked to me and said, so what happened in the chilla? And I told him, and I said, I learned I, uh, uh, this particular composition. And I recited the composition. And he said, where did you learn this? And I said, well, I think that there was this spirit, this being that came in my hallucination. And, and, and somehow I think he gave me this composition. My father didn't say a word, he just walked away. And then he muttered something to my mother. And then he was up and down and up and down and up and down. And after a while he came to me, he said, describe the man. I described him. So then he said, do you, he said, I have not taught you this composition. It's my great grand guru's composition. And now you have it. So he just could not say any other word out of, after that. And he just like, just put his hand on my head and walked away. So I had had this revelation, this experience, which uh, is, you know, it, uh, it's another worldly it's an experience. It's an amazing story, but it's also a story of renewal. It's, a, it's a, story. a story of renewal. It's yeah. a story of, 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 of uh, rebuilding of, of, of your faith in you and, yeah. and the faith in the tradition that you represent and, and, the, and faith in the source, your guru, your teacher, your father, and his teacher, and his teacher above him. And, and that all of that is real, that all of that is valid, it's, it's solid, and, and, and that it drives the engine that runs a being called Zakir Hussain. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anuradha, I know that we started late, so I, we are approaching the close of the two hours. Can I carry on for another 15 minutes or so? If Zakir and you allow this. You actually Absolutely. passed two hours. <laughs> no, we started at about 9.30 and it's now 11.30. Anuradha, have you gone yes. to sleep? No. Do you want us to stop? Do you can want you, us... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, no, absolutely. At some, absolutely. At some point, we should talk about thanking Anuradha ji because I mean, she yes. and the, the organization at G5A has gone through so much trouble to put all this together. I, I mean... Uh, what what a great place that is. Uh, uh, what a what should I say? What a place of creative energy is that place? It's a pod where everybody should come to and 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 see uh, knowledge just uh, growing in in various shapes and forms. And uh, I am really happy that I got I'm in some ways plugged into that uh, source. And uh, G5A is doing great work. And uh, this pandemic, this COVID ideas uh, are a little bit uh, less in motion than they should be. But uh, eventually, I think this will happen. It'll but happen. I have yeah. to also say to, say to people who are watching that the one thing that uh, identifies us as who we are is our culture, our tradition, is what we represent uh, as human beings of a particular way of life and 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 so that's important and 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 that is and the keepers of that are are the people who are in the creative arts in the creative world whether it's music or dance or writing or or filming or anything and and these people are are the people who don't have a 9 to 5 job who don't have a benevolent fund, who don't have social security, who don't have anything. They go day to day working. And, and, and I know that there are zillion musicians and artists and dancers and teachers, music teachers in, in India who are suffering and uh, don't know whether the next meals are going to come from. A place like G5A, uh, which nurtures uh, uh, the creative energy that these artists bring and, and, and finds a way to be able to help them and to be able to give them uh, the, a venue, a stage to be able to uh, uh, display their wear and, 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 and therefore have the ability to have a meal come to them, to have their rent paid. Uh, it, it's all happening because you, the listeners, the watchers, are able to contribute, are able to help, support, and if that does not happen and that dries up, uh, our culture will be in danger of oblivion. And, 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 and so we must think about that and we must pay as much attention as possible to being able to support that which we are. And, and, yes. and, and, and that's it. Thank so, you, Anuradha ji. Thank you, Anuradha. But while thanking you, can I? Should I continue? Should I stop? Should what, <laughs> you tell me what to do? Well, I have to tell you that in about an hour and a half, I have to be at Mickey Hart's place. We are I working don't think on a going record. To carry on for an hour and a half, Zakir. Exactly. Yeah, but even, I have a one. Even, <laughs> I have a one-hour drive. I have a one-hour so drive I'll, to his place. I'll just ask a couple more uh, questions, and we'll yes, end, and we'll sure, move sure. on to the audience. So yeah. one okay. of the ways I think time has helped people like you refine your instrument, refine the way you play your instrument, is actually technology. For me, hmm. when I listen to tabla players, great tabla players of yesteryear, and I listen to great tabla players of today, strangely, one of the biggest uh, demarcations that has happened is actually technology. They were great. Yeah. They are great today. But the way you can approach your playing, they could not have approached it in that manner. What, how has technology, right. microphones, sound systems, how has that changed the way you play today? Well, initially, when the sound system was introduced in the world of Indian music, uh, it was one of those Chicago radio round speakers. 
uh, with high mids and high end. That's it. And uh, and they were playing at distortion levels yeah. because outdoor concerts and, and they had to be played and heard. And uh, the musicians had no monitors. So what they were hearing back was this reverberating sound of bouncing off walls of the buildings out there coming back back at them and sounding very tinny and harsh and sharp mm. and uh, and they were dealing with that so uh, their playing was shaped accordingly the tone of their instruments was shaped accordingly the tabla players tabla makers made the drums accordingly to to fit with what was yeah. available in terms of sound production enhancement and 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 so on in this day and age we have much more refined state of the art sound equipment whereby you can actually uh equalize uh and and adjust the frequencies that the instrument provides now you can play na and say okay this is tuned to a so that means it's somewhere around 600 hertz so that means that on the graphic equalizer if the sound man uh, advances 600 hertz by one plus db it's going to make the resonance even more better and 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 this is the bass drum and it resonates at about 110 120 hertz so if the sound guy boosts that the bass will come through and so musicians are starting to understand that and so what happens is where we used to have now you have You can do that. You couldn't do that 50 yeah. years ago, 45 years ago. And, and because of that, the subtle elements uh, in the music, in other words, the graph, vertical graph of the dynamics has, has really expanded. The tunnel Absolutely. has become bigger. And, and, and because of that, the pl playing has changed. I couldn't think of playing melodic accompaniment to Pandit Shiv Kumar Sharma's Jhala. Yeah. In 1963, 64, I couldn't do that. 65, I couldn't do that. But I can do that now. I can hold the sa on the baya, which I couldn't do then. I mean, I can create an octave. so you've got that yeah. so that ability you could do it then but for just five ten people sitting around you you could show them this can be done but mm. in a 1000 seat pen doll at Savai Gandharva you couldn't do that yeah because it was not possible Absolutely. the sound system didn't have it but now you can and because of that the abilities have changed instead of you can go. You can do that. So this sound uh, uh, technical ability is really great thing, except there are pitfalls. I mean, the first, uh, I mean, thing that one thinks of uh, is Oh, I want more of this, more of this, more of this. Yeah. And it gets to a point where it can get so huge that uh, it can be distortion. Yeah. We tend to forget as musicians that the speakers are right up front here. So the louder they are, it's going to get incredible for the people in the back, but it's going to be unbearable for the people in the front. So you need to find a good balance. Yes and and to for this to work and and uh, so that's one thing that we must come to terms with 
we must understand that uh, as musicians and, and realize that uh, loud doesn't mean great, but to have the ability where the sound guy can enhance the pi or frequencies, enhance the frequency of the CHI, or, or, or lengthen the retention of the, of the resonance of the tabla without having to make it loud. Yeah, so basically it, that, adds to mod, it adds to modulation and it adds to dynamic and that uh, adds to nuance of, of how yeah. you play. Now, yeah. Anuradha's A is looking most forbidding, so I think we should come to a kind of conclusion. I want to yeah. do that. I, I'm going to skip up some of the chapters that I thought we'd deal with, but I don't think we have the time for it. We'll do it on another day. You uh, said six it, hours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm going to come... I'm going to come <laughs> To something that I've always wondered about and mm. it's something that uh, it's a story of told about Kishan Maharaj and one mm. day when he was asked uh, or when he was wished as he went into one of his concerts he said aaj tabla kya hai? Mm. and I think that's an extraordinarily uh, laden sentence of course because what I've always wondered after a lifetime of playing tabla and many lifetimes still to come, I hope, Zakir, what is this connection that you have built with those two pieces of equipment in front of you? Because it's not, it's not a mechanical connection. There is a spiritual no. connection over there. Absolutely. And, and I, I want to really understand, is, is that the instrument? Or are you the instrument? Uh, I think we collectively are the instrument uh, in some ways. I mean, this is my buddy. It's my brother, yeah. my sister, my friend, my father, my mother, my wife, everything. This is it. And it has always been with me. It has been at my side from day one of my understanding of what's around me and and uh, it it is said that half of the effort in being able to learn and become a good musician is to be able to get accepted by your instrument yeah. when you listen to Ustad Vilad Khansa play sitar and he hits five, sometimes six notes on one fret. Six, that's almost an impossibility. It is yeah. an impossibility. <laughs> yes. So, and when he does that, it is because the instrument said, yeah, my friend, you want this done? Okay, we can do this. Hmm. To have that relationship with the instrument, and, and sometimes the instrument looks at Vilat Khan Sahib and says, come on me, what do you want? I'll do it. That kind of a relationship happens. A belief in the Indian world of music is that each instrument has a spirit in it. And the effort, half the effort is to be able to get that spirit to accept you. And if that relationship is established and th that acceptance has been given, uh, half the battle is won. That's one. On a surface level, technical level, when you're going to play on a particular stage, weather has a lot to do with it. The lights have a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, humidity, you know, all that stuff. So if you're playing a concert, in outside in September, uh, the humidity is very strong. The skins become very loose and therefore the response uh, goes down by about 60%. So you have really, you know, you, you can only do so much. You can only hope that the spirits inside, inside the instrument rise to the occasion and allow you to be able to express yourself the way you are feeling it that day. 
So it has a lot to do with not just how you're feeling it, but if the instrument will want to be a part of the telling of the story that day yeah. or not. And it has a lot to do with the environment and the ambience and everything around you. And, and, and so that's there. Thirdly, of course, what happens to Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sahib a few times, the thought process is there. You're telling the instrument about it, but the instrument on that day is not in the mood for that to happen. So if you're Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sahib, you're big, breaking 500 strings <laughs> and he's like putting them back on and all sorts of crazy things are happening. So it's the instrument and someday you just hit the instrument and you hit that saw on the on the metal board and the resonation is such that you're in yeah the doors open you're in and 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 the rest is just easy as a pumpkin pie <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to leave the audience with a thought um while anuradha gets ready with their questions <laughs> And that is that I have actually heard Zakir for about 50 years now. And at his best, he has transported me several times. He has transported me to a point I would not have reached on my own. And when I think about it and have thought about it and tried to decipher and articulate what it was about what he did that took me there, I have not found the words. So I'm glad that there is a poet, E.E. E. Cummings, who for me distills and defines what Zakir actually does. So I want to leave everybody with this thought. Cummings is talking about the advent of spring, but I think he is describing what Zakir does to perfection. This is what he says. Spring is like a perhaps hand in a window, carefully to and fro moving new and old things while people stare, carefully moving a perhaps fraction of flower here, placing an inch of air there and without breaking anything. Ah. Thank you, Zakir. Thank you. And same, Anurabh. same applies to you. <laughs> Over to you, Anurab. Hi, Anuji. What can I say? <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I've been fighting hard. Oh gosh, <laughs> to hold back the tears and and. <laughs> and also really finding my way back from the trance you have both carried us through. Uh, this is what you art look great. does. This is what <laughs> art does to people. I don't think I can say anything more. <clears throat> except that we all and G5A are blessed. Ah, <laughs> and You're too kind. We've, we've actually all of us have decided not to have any questions raised because I think okay. this, energy, this energy is something we'd all like to hold on to. Okay. And I can't begin to say how grateful I am that we should. In that case, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, so. <laughs> I have no, to thank I, the audience. Uh, I have to thank you for allowing Shumantro Bhai and me this opportunity to talk, uh, which we don't get very often, and and mm. to share with uh, the people uh, what what has been uh, in the forefront of our minds for many many decades, and. Uh, uh, Thank the audiences, who, whoever is there left at this point, uh, for uh, dialing in and and uh, watching yeah. us. 
So, you know, keep doing that. It's important for us to know that what we are doing is is being appreciated. And, and, and that is uh, injection of energy for artists. Thank you. This, Thank this, you actually was, uh, this actually was a masterclass on life. And um, ah. I have to say, it's been a brilliant note to bring Should Art 2020 to a close. Um, as, as our journey at G5A grows stronger, more enriched, and most importantly, with many more friends now. Thank you for being part of our fifth anniversary celebrations. And I sincerely hope you will join us as co-travelers on our con con continuing journey as we okay. move towards and through the portal, as you said, with little else but tools for our art, strength of, for our voices, and hope for our children. Yes. A very, very big Amen. thank you to our community who so spontaneously and graciously came on board to celebrate with us. To all our audiences who listened in and will continue to listen in, and to Team Team G5A, who I've called on at this point, who embraced the crazy deadlines and worked 24/7 with ownership, responsibility, steadfastness, and hope. Come on, Team G5A. Okay, so should art 2020? We did it. You did indeed. Yes, you did. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, so thank you. Much, and thanks. Thank you, Ad thank you, Aditya Srinivasan for Aditya. from Chennai Aditya. for Aditya. running Absolutely, the sound for yes. us. Thank Time you. to leave. Take care, Bye, guys. Doctor. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.